Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. So tonight's episode of the Barbarian Hour, we're going to have Dr. Mike Matten. Mike was Delta High School's first state champion in Delta, Ohio, Northwest Ohio, west of Toledo, Ohio, just south of the Michigan border. Coach Matten, I always knew him as now, you know, Dr. Matten, uh, Mike, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Zeb. How are you? And Jared, uh, thanks for having me on. What's up? Yeah, what's up, awesome, coach. Man. Well, you call him Coach, Doctor, Mike. I mean, you got a lot of names. You get a lot. I mean, Best Uncle Ever. I know that's a name. We don't know the joke, but uh, you know, Best Uncle Ever is one of them. But um, out of the gate, give it to us straight. How is Cole Matt? And I saw him wrestling Ball Bartlett on Big Time Network the other night. How is Cole Matt? And it looked like a high ankle sprain. How is he doing? Yeah, uh, you're exactly. We just he just had his X-ray this afternoon about two thirty. The X-ray was uh, negative for any fracture. Um, he can't walk on it. Can't put weight. It's swollen. And uh, so yeah, so it's it, he's you know at first he thought he broke it. I saw him. I was at the event and he was what six seconds into the match and uh, I saw him yell like I could see his mouth saying I broke it and uh, he went immediately went to his ankle and but you know. You know, good or bad, it, it's it's a bad spread. So, um, so yeah. So unfortunately, he'll probably be done for quite some time. Now you know how I I knew immediately, right? My wife and I were watching it. Um, she's she's an Ann Arbor girl, and I was like, oh my god, that's a high ankle sprain. And she said, I remember my wife actually lived with me in college, and she's like, I remember when that happened with you to you. I lived with you, and I was like, it was horrible. It was the one of the, you know, obviously I've had my ACL, MCL, LCL, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, all that stuff. And I had it all repaired, right? Well, the a, uh, MCL, LCL, you don't repair, right? Right. Those repair themselves. And an ACL, they, they grafted from the middle of my patella. The high ankle sprain was, was a way, way more involved as far as pain. It was because, you know, I just never felt right again, right? And it's just a tough injury to come off of and his season for all intents and purposes is probably over. Yeah, I, I, I told him that that night and I think he realized that. And, you know, I told my wife, you know, I had not to sound negative, but I said, I hope he kind of broke it. A nice clean break a lot of times can heal faster than those bad ankle sprains. But uh, regardless, he's got a lot of work ahead of him and uh, uh, be on the, on the men. So him and Zach can mend together. Okay, so right now you have three boys on the Michigan team. Next year, you'll only have two. That's what Correct. probably what the, what the hope is. Drew, well, first off, Cole had a great match with Sammy Sasso. I wanted to talk about that. He got the first takedown. He was in there with Sammy Sasso, and he was scrapping, right? How proud are you when you know he's going at that level? Yeah, I mean, I you know, we talk all the time about just, you know, control what you can control and you control effort and your attitude. And I thought he had a great attitude. He was excited about the opportunity. He called me about it two hours before and, and was pumped about it, talked about his game plan. And uh, he it was nice to see him execute that. I wish he would have could have finished the match a little stronger, but he, he had a, he gave him a lot all he wanted uh, for for quite a quite the match and and uh, he wrestled really hard. He had a nice season, you know, placed a Cliff Keen at 141, and then uh, when Stevan came back at the end of this halfway through the year, uh, he bumped up to 149. So how many matches does he have? Is he going to fit the criteria for the the medical? Do you think? 
Uh, no, he, he's got a lot of matches. I think he's probably he's got, got a lot of 15. Matches. Yeah. He's probably got 15 or so. Yeah. He's probably over the criteria. Cause I think it's under 20%. If I, if I'm guessing that correctly, right. 15 or 20% of the, of the matches that could possibly wrestle. And we, you know, with COVID they they don't even know how many dates they have left. Right. Like it's, it's just, it's a wild thing happening right now. Uh, right. what is that? Is that what's going on with Zach? Zach Men. Uh, Zach's a freshman there and uh, just finished his first semester. He was at Michigan State Open, is uh, wrestling 149. He was in the semis and uh, uh, he got taken down by the, I think, Luca Wick, uh, Evan Wick's little brother from Cal State Poly. And he kind of looked over and kind of grimaced a little bit, came off the match and he's like, man, my knee hurts. I was like, well, can you finish? He said, yeah, I'll finish. Finished up, uh, practice all week, was a little sore. And then the night before the Cal State Bakerfield duel, he wasn't going to wrestle. He's going to redshirt. It locked up at practice, couldn't bend it, couldn't move it. So they ended up scoping him and he had a 80% meniscus tear. So they had to repair it. Um, and, you know, the difference between repair or remove is about five months. So he's on a week six or seven of that. So he's got another four and a half months or so before he's back uh, to full go. Medial or lateral? Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I I actually don't remember what he told me. I can't remember. I wasn't there for the surgery. I was working. I wasn't there for the doctor's appointment. Uh, I can't remember which part of the meniscus it was. I think lateral, did, if I remember right. Did it flip? Yes. Flip. Yeah, that sucks. I had the same thing. My knee would just lock at random times. It sucked. What sucked for me was I was like coaching. It was my first year out of college, and my knee would just lock as I was walking. Mm. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we talked about with the doc before the surgery, we just said, you know, do what's best for him long-term, right. You know, short-term, you know, I know he wanted to get back on the map, but uh, it was, it was a no brainer with it being about 75, 80% torn. So years ago, right. They, most people just take that right out. Right. Now it's, yes. Yeah. And then, then you pay for it later. Right. Now it's, yes. You get it fixed up right way. And, but it's a longer recovery. Right. Correct. Correct. He was pretty, he was bummed. Not, not how he expected his season to go. Not when your dad's a doctor. I think your dad <laughs> is going to tell you 10 out of 10 times, get it repaired. You'll thank me later. Right. Exactly. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, wrestling's a small part of, it's a big part of our life, but in the grand scheme of life, it's a small part. And, you know, when you're 50, 60 years old, you don't want to pay the price of not, of, of taking it out when you're 19 or 20 uh, versus getting it repaired the right way to do it. So um sounded like it was a no brainer and, and they did the right thing. And so you're 50, you and my brother Chad are the same age, right? Yep. Turned 50 in November. Yeah. So you and Chad are, uh, so wait, you just turned 50 in November? Yes. No, yeah, so Chad you're, was you're like Chad. You're, you're super young for the grade. No, Chad was 91 or 89, right? Or what are 90? you? I'm 90. You're 90. Okay, so he's 89 and you're 90. Okay, because he was super young for the grade. Chad's like a June birthday. He grad. He turned 18 after high school. Oh, okay. Wow, he was a baby. Yeah. Do you guys won in 89 though? Right. Correct. Okay, so when you won in 89, who won? You and Robson Tobin. Yeah, Rob, Rob Sintobin and I, yeah. And who were the other placers? Um, who were the other placers in 89? Oh, my gosh. We had Paul Badenhop. Uh, he took fourth. Uh, we had Mike Wolford. He took fifth, a heavy, undersized heavyweight. Um, we had, who else was our placers there? Uh, Dusty Moore. No, he was a year at 88. So I think we had five placers that year, so. Wow. You are not, um, even, so. you're not even sniffing a trophy with five placers now. Do you realize that in any division? I'm not even close, right? Not it's even close. crazy. It's changed well, don't so you much. Remember, but... You remember when uh, the Durlins won uh, the state title just with the brothers? They had three yes. three, cha three champs, I think, or two champs. They had two brothers and uh, the Abbott, Jeff Abbott. I think they won the state tournament, West Liberty Salem, with two champs and a, a third champ, three champs that won the whole tournament. So, you, you know, which is a lot of points, but nothing compared to now, right? It was like 80 points or something like that. Wow. That one. The Jordans won like that too. Je Jim and Jeff won. One of the Stickleys placed and they had maybe one other placer. I think that's all Graham had. If they had a fifth placer, I'd be shocked, but I believe it was four placers, maybe some other qualifiers. And it's all like, it's all the same names, right? It's all the same names of the usual suspects in the Graham lineups that you see. Yes. And it's kind of, kind of crazy to see you guys are similar to that though, Delta 
So you won your first title in 89. What was their last title? Uh, 2016, I believe it was. 2016. What year was Drew? I forget. Drew was a junior that year. Yeah, so they won it. Drew's junior year, Anthony Carrizales, who was on state championship teams there. Yeah, 99. Yep, yeah, 99. They were they had a phenomenal team in 98. I think they set the record for most record points ever. Yeah, it was crazy, right? Yeah, it was, I didn't want to bring it up in front of Jared. I didn't want to bring <laughs> it up in front of Jared, Mike. I didn't want to bring those teams up in front of Jared because that was the year Jared won his fourth state title. And were you guys runner up, Jared? Yeah, runner up three times and third uh, my junior year. Jared won every year, but his team was runner up or third. We yeah, uh, that team was the, the, the one of the best teams we've ever thought about having. I think uh, yeah, we took every we I think we took twelve down to state and ten were placers or something that year. We broke the record uh, for most points. It was it was pretty amazing. How bad did you know it beat that? They handled it pretty good, actually. <laughs> so. Genoa, Genoa had a team, man. Were they six champs? They had a lot. They had a lot. They, they put the work in, and you saw that train coming for a couple of years away, and uh, it, it came to fruition, which is always nice to see. Why is Division Three in Northwest Ohio so dominant, Mike? What's your, what's your opinion? You guys were kind of um, after Stretch, right? Stretch And Stretch won D2, didn't they? Um, I think they did. Yeah. And it was, it was double A then, right? Correct. And you yeah. guys won D3. Wait, you guys were D2. No, we were D3. We moved we to D3. D3. Oh, okay. Yeah. We moved to D3 in like 86, 85, something like okay. that or 80, uh, no 80. Uh, actually it would have been my, my freshman year when we were still D2. So been the year after that. So 87, 88. What's your theory? What's your theory on Northwest Ohio and the small schools being so successful? Well, I think, you know, I, I'm a believer of success breeds success. And so when you're around success and, and you expect success, it, it kind of is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that the bar has been set pretty high in this area. You got, you got a lot of good options to train and you, you start getting kids of kids had success. And, and then that turns into uh leads to a success in a program, especially smaller schools, you know, you can make quite the impact with a, with a few families, as you know. What are the, the families, right? I, I know Matt and Sintobin are the big ones I know, obviously, at Delta. What are some other families where they've got multi-generational people? Um, Dean Taylor's kids are wrestling in the program now. I know that because I know Dean, we're around the same age. But what are some other names of people who had multi-generational families, fathers, sons, wrestle at Delta. Yeah, the Ford uh, Ford family, they had uh, five boys, four of them, I th three of them wrestled, and uh, they were all uh, very good. Um, I think one of them was a two-time placer. Um, you have, uh, well, the Nag well, Mark Nagel, his kids are going to be coming up. I mean, so we just got a lot of, uh, you know, repeat nephews and nieces of kids that, you know, my their brother wrestled and then, the, you know, the, the nephew wrestled. So um, it's like probably Sandusky too, you know, you see the same names over and over again. You look at the forwards in Archbold, right? You got uh, those folks and, and, and such. So you got some pretty good families out there. So our last Matten is Adam and he is a freshman, right? Yes. All three boys, Drew, Cole, Zach, are all state champs at least one time. Mm -hmm. And then Adam is the fourth. So Adam's good. He's got what Troy Offer and I had going on, right? Yeah, all the three brother older brothers were state champs, and then it gets to Adam. I think Adam's obviously in a better position to win than I was, right? I think that he's probably in a situation like a Troy Opper, you know, he, he can win multiple titles, in my opinion. And Troy was in the finals multiple times. So, how do you keep the pressure off of him? How do you keep him grounded? How do you keep him in a, in a good state of mind and not worrying about his brother state titles and worry about doing and maximizing his success? Yeah, you know, I worried about that a lot when he was younger, um, a lot. And, and I thought about that a lot because I see it happen a lot. Um, but his personality is in such that it really doesn't come up that much. We talk a lot about, again, about especially this year because he's really undersized. We talk about, you know, the things that he can control and about, you know, putting the match that he wants together. And for the most part, he's he's been delivering um 
about what I expected from him. He's, he's tough. He gets out, he gets outgunned by some of the really big one Oh sixes. Um, but he's, he's, he's right there. And, you know, I, I've seen so many matches from all the boys. Um, to be honest, I haven't even thought about him worrying about his brothers and such and trying to live up to that. I think he recognizes what they did was has no bearing on him and uh, they can't help him when he's out there. And so he's got to figure it out. No one cares. Right. So no, no, listen, I found out firsthand. Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares, Mike. I can tell you that. I mean, it's crazy because now I have two nephews who are state champs. I got three brothers who are state champs. I never got the job done, right? Never got the job done. And that's what's crazy about it. I was fifth as a senior and it, it you know, and, and it hasn't changed me in my life, right? But Troy Opper, Jared's younger brother, who's actually my neighbor who lives in Sugar and Falls, South Russell area. Um, you know, same thing happened to him. He got, did he get like a, a default overtime pin, Jared? Is that what happened? Uh, yeah, double boots called stalemate, went to back to center, didn't start the clock and he got pulled over and pinned. They put the boots back in, but um, they're just weird. One of those weird situations, you know. It was against Sergeant, wasn't it, Ben Sergeant? I think he went like two and six against him, and no, six and two, six and two, six and two. Sorry, six and two. Yeah, he's six and two versus Ben Sergeant, and he told me two of the losses are in the state finals, I believe. Right, but that is insane. Yeah, that. Ah, wow. <laughs> but Mike, how on you know. We talked big picture, right? What, Drew's going to be in medical school next year. Is that right? Yeah, he, yep, he got accepted into medical school and he's still uh, interviewing to see if he gets in any other places that he wants to go. But yeah, he got into Ohio University. So he's real, we're real excited and he's real excited for that. So what's the conversation, right? Obviously wrestling, like you said, it's a big part. Um, you know, what's the conversation like with them when they're younger and, and kind of how do you instill that big picture with them? We, I mean, obviously when they're younger, they, you know, they, they don't have perspective, right? So we talked about, we, you know, we just, you know, my wife, I'm, I'm very blessed by an awesome wife, right? right and right. so we, we, we talked, we kind of, when we, before we had kids, we talked a lot about, you know, how you think uh, things will go. And uh, we, you know, we both agreed she'd handle the academics, I'd handle the athletic components of it. And, and we both need to support each other in, in, in such, because I, to be honest, I wasn't, you know, I, I don't get all worked up over little kids grades. My wife gets really worked up over that stuff. Um, for me, it's all about effort. And if you're going to do something, you do it your absolute best in, in, uh, in whatever that is. And, and I know that sounds very cliche, uh, but when they were six, seven, five, uh, they did just, time after time after time if it wasn't hard enough or fast enough and it wasn't like you're yelling at them just harder faster faster harder you know so that was kind of a common theme on the wrestling side was just about effort and then we just parlayed that same effort hard drive tried to in uh the academic world or whatever realm they're trying to to be successful in gotcha gotcha no I don't know if it's on air appropriate, but is there, wasn't there a trick something about having all boys? What was the caffeine or what, what's, what was the trick? <laughs> I wish I would have known this, you know, a few years yeah. back. I'm, I'm obviously a girl dad, but is that true or is there I something there? My wife would probably kill me if I went into that story, but there, uh, <laughs> there, there's a couple good stories there. And I, you know, at the 1996 state tournament, they, my wife and I were engaged and uh, we were sitting in the stands and before the finals, they did the Brothers of Ohio Wrestling. And um, there was like the DeSabados, the Durnlands, the Jordans and uh, Marinelli's. Uh, they, there was, you know, the, oh, all the folks from with the Bishop. Yeah. And, and so I was sitting up there. And I said, listen, all I want out of you is four boys. You give me four boys. I'll get you any car you want. And, uh, and after the, we, she was pregnant with the fourth kid, Adam, and, and she, we didn't never knew what we were having. I go, what do you think we're having? She goes, what do you think? And so, um, so yeah, we had four boys, but yeah, there, there is a funny story about the, 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 the having the boys and Tommy Rollins came over, did a camp years ago. And I talked to him a little bit cause he had a daughter and he was like, talk to me about this. And about, I don't even remember, maybe it was a year later or two years later, he, I get a call, I'm having twin boys. And he was so excited. It was pretty funny. So, um, but yeah, that, that's uh yeah. So you got the job done. Your wife got, got the, the job done. What car is she driving? 
Well, it's funny. After we had Adam, I went out and uh, bought her a minivan, and uh, she didn't think that was funny. Uh, but she, you know, she she said, "I'll wait for that till after the boys are gone. I'll get my car I want." So, so for our 25th wedding anniversary, I bought her a 1966 uh, uh, Bronco. So uh, that's uh, sweet. That's yeah, awesome. her grandpa had one, so I, I I surprised her with that. So it's uh yeah, I had it re completely redone. So we enjoyed that up at the summer convertible. That's awesome. Did you trailer it up or drive it up? Oh gosh, no, I trailered it. It's a <laughs> it's a V six, a hundred horsepower. It goes about 50, 55. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, because you can't drive the old Jeeps either. The old Jeeps, those only go like fifty five or something. Yeah, yep. the, the the rear ends aren't built for like highway speeds, and they were like. Same thing with that thing. It was like a, a vehicle that you drove around a farm or drove around the country, right? Right. That's crazy. Um, I like to focus on, you know, you, you're a huge, gigantic liar when you say that you focus on the academics, I'll focus on the athletics because you're a huge component in their academics. I mean, you got a kid that's in, he's accepted into med school and drew, and then um, you do some really interesting things with your sons. You do trips. You do some reading. There's a lot of things you do. Talk about that real quick and just give us some insight as to why you read the books you read and you take the trips you take. Yeah, um, you know, I, I worked for one of my one of the presidents of the hospital I was at about, uh, I think Drew was in, I don't know, junior high or something. He, he told me about what he does with the kids when they graduated high school. They did a father-son trip and, and he had the son plan the trip and it could be any trip in the United States and they would do it together, just those two. And uh, so I asked, I said, Drew, what do you want to do? And he's like, I have no idea. And I said, well, start asking around, start figuring it out. And and he was young and, and stuff. I think he was, we started talking about his freshman year and he ended up, uh, he picked uh, going uh, whitewater rafting in the uh, middle fork of the Salmon River out in Idaho we did a hundred mile whitewater rafting trip which was a week long and and that was amazing and then um, the other two boys uh, chose golfing trips uh, Drew or Zach and, and Cole so it's just kind of a time where we can go bond is is father son because we recognize once they get out of the house right there's a lot less of that and as I'm now down to one child I kind of really enjoyed that time and it kind of means that much more to me and uh so that's that's about the trip. But wait, you but you do way more trips. Like you guys do Yosemite, you do Whitney, oh, you do yeah, all these yeah, other yeah. things. Yeah, oh, I can on talk top about of that. Yeah. I get. The, listen, yeah. the guys, the guys who who blew their trip on golfing. I I hope those guys love golfing. I hope yeah. that they love that, right? Yeah, right? But you gave them. They could have gone and done Hawaii. Anywhere. They could have done anything. Denali. They could have yes. done anything, right? Yes, anything, and they chose golf, which is so. Oh right? my god, Denali. So, yeah. Denali by a million. I just want you to know Hawaii and Denali by a million, right? Have you guys yeah. ever gone to Hawaii, Mike? I've not. My wife, well, that's on her bucket list, but we have not done that. So, and she, uh, that my wife put her foot down. She said, I haven't went to Hawaii. You're not taking the boys to Hawaii before I go to Hawaii. So she did veto any Hawaii trip, but uh, yeah, we've, we've done a lot of uh, cool trips. We did the rim to rim uh, with my dad and myself and my older three boys. We did rim to rim, hiked it in a day. Grand Canyon for people Grand who don't know Can what rim yeah. to rim is. Yep, Grand Canyon, Rim to Rim. We did uh, what we did type Mount Whitney last year, uh, which was uh, that that was the lower, the highest mountain in the lower 48 uh, out in California. And uh, that my dad and myself and all four of my boys did that. And uh, that was quite, that was miserably challenging. Uh, I thought I got, Zach and I got uh, altitude sickness. And so that was painful. Um, and then, you know, we've, you know, hiked, hiked Half Dome, uh, Angels Landing, you know, Zion did that whole, whole thing there. So yeah, you know, it's, you know, you're fortunate enough to have your children for, a, you know, a finite amount of time. And we just want to maximize that time. And I like them and they seem to like being with me. And, and so we try to maximize that and, and do things because you recognize the world's a big place. And, uh, you know, why not try to share it with someone you love? I love it. Jared, did you take some notes there? Did you, you might have to make sure you play that back and write down everything you said, because we're, we're going to do it. I'm going to tell you that right now. The Miller boys are going to do it whether they like it or not. We're doing it and they're going to figure it out. And I've done some of that stuff with my nephews, Owen and Bodie. Uh, Owen's a junior at Oak Harbor. Bodie's an eighth grader. We've done a man. We did iceberg Lake at a glacier. I did a bunch with glacier at glacier. We did North cascades. My nephew Owen and I did this loop, uh, Heather pass maple pass. 
I mean, we gained 4,000 feet of elevation. And, you know, when you're nice. from Northwest Ohio, <laughs> that's a lot feet of elevation is a massive gain, let alone four or 5,000 feet. Right, Mike? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no doubt about it. So I, I was hurting on Mount Whitney when that was, I forget how many thousand feet, but that was, that was a tough one for me. 14,000. It's over 14. Yeah, 14, five, whatever. And, and I think you start at nine or eight or something like that is a lot. It took is all it John day. Muir it's trail. Tough. Is it John Muir? Um, no, that's not John Muir. I don't it's think, I, I don't think that's part of it. Um, no, uh, we, when we did uh, half dome, we did part of John Muir trail, okay. but I don't think, uh, Mount Whitney was on, was that. So have you done render rim on the Grand I've Canyon? Done rim to rim. I've done uh, uh, no, I have yeah. not, but I, I, I've, I'll do it. Yeah. But you got to do have to light because the thing about rim to rim is, um, when you get down in the Canyon in the Grand Canyon, it's super hot and you got to plan that one. Right. Don't you? I don't know. We started at four in the morning and finished at five thirty or six o'clock at night. So it was a long day. How hot it was? Uh, it wasn't bad. We did it in um, late September, so it was perfect weather. We were. It rained in the morning. That was the only bad thing. But we were in short sleeve shirt or like a light long sleeve shirt. And uh, uh, Drew was cutting weight for Super Thirty Two, so Drew wore sweatshirt, sweatpants, <laughs> and uh, stuff the whole trip for fourteen hours. And uh, uh, that was that was brutal. What is rim to rim total distance? A uh, twenty five mile. Twenty five. Mm -hmm. Man, you guys were freaking trucking, man. Yeah. The it was, thing about rim to rim is it's a down, up, down, up. Well, yeah, down across and then up. Yeah. Like 6,000 or 7,000 foot elevation in the last, when you've already done 20 miles. It, so oh it was, God. yeah, it, it was, it was a challenge and, you know, it's nice to do that with yourself, right? Put they put that challenges out there. All right. Cool. And, to do it with your dad too, right? I mean, how cool is that to do that with your dad and your sons and like, not maybe not that one, but do some of those trips with, with, yeah, you know, the whole family. Right. I know it. I'm fortunate. My dad is like, yeah, he, he can hike me under the table. So he, that's he's, wild. How old is uh, that guy? He's seven. Uh, be, he's 69. He'll be 70 this, this year. Your dad's a freak. He's a mutant. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. He went back and did uh, Whitney again last year. He called me up and he's like, or this past year, he's like, you want to go again? I'm like, no chance. So, uh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> so he, he went out there and did it by himself. So, again. so what's his trick? Cause I mean, obviously he's not doing that hiking in Northwest Ohio. So what, what's he just do a lot of walking and then. Yeah. yeah there's a, re yeah, there's a reservoir with about 75 steps and he just walks up and down the, the, the steps over and over and over again. So that's, a, that's how he does it. Mike, have you done the Manitou Incline? I have not. It is a, under a mile. Okay. It's the Cog Railroad, old Cog Railroad, just um, uh, west of Colorado Springs and Manitou Springs. Oh, and the Cog. Is, yeah, the boys. Yeah, I heard uh, about that. Do you know anything about it? I know Drew, Drew did it and he said it was super hard. So, uh, have you, no, that's all I know. It, I've done it twice. I did it once with my wife and she tried to turn around and I had a Jedi mind tricker because <laughs> we were going to visit Dustin Kilgore. And, uh, she did not like when I told her that Kilgore is probably not going to make fun of her at all about not doing it. <laughs> and it was, there's a, cause there's a bailout the halfway, like almost two thirds of the way up. You can bail out and do switchbacks on the way down. So I was like, we got there and she's like, I was 20. 20 steps above her there's 2768 steps it is 2000 elevation feet of elevation gain in under and like 0.9 of a mile wow that's that's very steep the grades are 45 percent to 68 percent wow that's crazy <laughs> yeah and uh like um, uh, apollo anton ono i did finally break an hour once i did finally break an hour once everyone was like making fun of me i did an hour and 10 minutes and then like 59 minutes, everyone's like, you couldn't break an hour. And it's like really hard because the elevation is really hard to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah, broke it. he, 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 he was crazy fast, right? Didn't he run up it? Yeah, Apollo Anton Ono did it in like 17 minutes or something. Crazy. Holy crap. Like a total freak. I, I Don't quote me. I mean, we can just Google it and find it, you know, because Google's made us dumber. We don't have to really search for knowledge. But he's a freak. He's a total mutant. He's the speed skater. And yeah. um yeah, he ran up in like 17 or 18 minutes, something. And you know, there's like these ultra people, ultra 
extreme marathon people that there's got to be someone probably faster who just trains and that's all they do for a living but that it's freaky man it's freaky and it's painful i will say it's painful you know to, to do it but it would be a great training thing for like rim to rim or something yeah oh, absolutely you gotta hit it you're gonna hit it i know you're gonna hit it i know you guys are like- going on. you're marking it down in your brain right now and you're, you're you guys are hitting manitou incline sooner than later i got a feeling absolutely i'm in i know it. i know you will you'll you'll and you'll eat it up you'll have fun um what uh what's the reading material talk about the reading material that the Matin boys have to do and, and the the uh it is uh a prerequisite to being a man <laughs> a man well, a Matin man i think well i don't know if they, i think they'd all i think that's the least favorite thing i ever made them do so uh, I like listening to books. I'm not a big reader, but I listen to books on Audible all the time. And one of the first books I, I listened to was um, Atlas Shrugged by uh, Anne Ron. And uh, I, I love the book because uh, I thought it had a lot of great messages. And that, you know, the number one message that I took from it was it's okay to be successful. It's okay to want to work hard and be more successful than your, your coworkers or your, your friends and things like that. And it's okay to, 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 to drive to be, to get to that level. It's kind of how I took from it. And so when, by the time they were eighth grade, I, their eighth grade year, I made them all read that book, which is, you know, 14, 1500 pages. So um, I found out after the fact that Cole like listen to like some book like uh, the the cassettes on it and and you know you know skip chapters and stuff which is very typical Cole's that's a boy I would have figured would do that but the rest of them the rest of them all actually did it and, and such so yeah why why What's why that? is that such an important thing for you to do I know that you just gave us the lessons of it right but why uh, yeah. is this 1500 page 14 whatever long it is over a thousand pages why is it so important for the Matt and boys to do that you know, I, I, I mean, it probably sounds a little corny, but, you know, I, I think that what I feel is that a lot of people accept mediocrity and a lot of people make you feel guilty for wanting to be successful. And, and I just don't want my kids to ever feel like they could, they have to settle or it's okay to settle. And I think it goes back to wanting to be the best version of yourself you can. And so when you give them like this daunting assignment, can you imagine being 14 and your dad hands you 1500 pages and say, you got nine months to do it. Like part of it was the message, but part of it was grinding through it, right? Like grinding through 50, 75 pages uh, of the book uh, when you don't want to do it after going to BTWs in Myland and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so I think it was a couple different reasons, you know, doing something you don't want to do because you think, you know, ultimately, even though you like the book, but you know, that you're doing something that you're really kind of not really excited about. Um, and then the message that I think it, it can deliver, you know, the kids. So Jared, you taking notes on that one at all? Yeah. So, so how'd you find out Cole didn't really read it? What was it? Well, how'd that come well, out? Yeah, because while well, Adam, you know, just finished his eighth grade year, he finished the book. I was all proud of him. We talked a lot, sat down, had a conversation about what he learned, what he liked, what he didn't like. And then, um, so I texted like a picture to the boys. I'm like, Adam's part of the team now, you know, and Cole's like, uh, uh, by the way, I never read that. So, and I, so I'm like, but we had conversations on it, Cole. He's like, oh, I just, I, I, I read pages here and there, and and just listen, and, and got online and read what it was about. So, that that's uh, that was Cole. That was my relationship with Cole. So, sounds like uh, you pissed the, the Drew of our pissed? family. The definitely the Drew. Yeah, yeah. the Drew Upper. Yes, Cole Manton is the Drew Upper. There you go. I'll give you that. That is a great analogy. There. Were you pissed? <laughs> Were you mad? Yeah. Well, enough time that three, you know, what is seven years had passed since then. Uh, it it just it didn't surprise me, you know, because that at that time in Cole's life, um, he, you know, uh, he he was a he was he, he was a challenging young man. Let's put it that way. So uh, I'd say it's blue. He'd say it's black, and so I'd say up. He'd say down. So uh, yeah. So yeah, that was that was a year. That was a year he told me he was going to play basketball and not wrestle. Oh. That, that's drew too they stop drew, it drew did that stop it he did not say that to you oh the whole story i'll, I'll, I'll tell it'll probably be embarrassed by this but he talked about it his senior high school 
So he, 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 uh, it was November, first week of practice in November of eighth grade year. He's a little soft. He hadn't hit puberty yet. He was, you know, and, and he had been having success, but not the success his older brother had and not the success Zach was having, who was a couple of years behind him. And so he pulled me up to his room and he's like, dad, I'm not going to, I'm not wrestling. I'm going to play basketball. And I was like, in my brain, I'm like, well, okay, like every parenting book tells you, let them do what they want. And, you know, so I was like, oh my gosh, why do I handle this? So I was like, no, you're just being silly. He's like, no, I'm, I'm playing, I'm basketball. I am not wrestling. And then I got a little fired up and I just said, hey, here's the deal. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Have I ever steered you wrong in life? And he's like, no. I said, all right. I said, do you like homework? No. I said, but you do it, right? Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. You're going to wrestle. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to wrestle. I said, you don't want to wrestle because Drew's having success and because Zach's having success and you're not winning state titles in seventh grade, sixth grade or eighth grade and stuff. I guess he won his uh, one of those years. And uh, he's like, no, I just, I just don't like it. And I said, well, you're wrestling and that's the end of this conversation. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, mean, I just, I just blew it as dad one one right? Like, so I'm, I'm really, and so he turned around, got mad, punched his bed and broke his hand. Like, like, just like that, turned around, broke his hand. I said, I said, I said, um, hey, here's the deal. You're going to get a cast. You broke your hand. We'll go get it set. Six weeks, you're going to go back to the wrestling room. You're going to have practice. And you know, so his eighth grade year was kind of a, a little bit of a mess. He came back and he did it, never really complained. And then his freshman year, he, that summer after his eighth grade year, he, the, the light switch hit, he started hitting puberty and he was all in and he came to me and he's like, you know what? I'm so glad that you didn't let me quit. I don't know what I was thinking. And, uh, you know, I lost a ton of sleep over that conversation, you know, because you never know what the right thing to do is. Uh, but I felt like I had a good enough relationship with him and knew him well enough. And, uh, you know, I must admit, I wasn't sure if I was right at the moment, but I knew he was quitting for the wrong reason. Because he, you know, he, I just knew, I knew why he was quitting. He was quitting because he wasn't winning as much as his brother's. And he was thinking about that too much. And he told that story, uh, his senior year speech after high, high school. And he just, you know, he thanked me, um, you know, for not letting him go down that road um, and such. That's awesome. That's that's definitely uh, sounds like something with, with Drew and my dad story right there. <laughs> it wasn't awesome at the moment. No, you know, no. But looking he, back, right. It, looking back. And I'm sure there's other stories that are going to come out. Uh, from the boys growing up that you don't know about, right? That you're like, oh, <laughs> that, right? Yeah, exactly. So, Mike, you, uh, you and the boys obviously have a special relationship. You know, you're able to do things like that. Um, you know, the biggest thing with being a doctor, right? Um, you do the most noble work. You save lives, and uh, the thing about that is, there's a lot of responsibility with it. It's just like. If we're going to get lame here. We're going to go with Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. Right. <laughs> and you're always jumping into action. My brother, Chad, just told me a story about one of his uh, junior high kids dislocates his elbow. Do you remember this? I think it was Eisenhower tournament. Uh, I don't remember that one. I've done so many elbows over the last five or six years, uh, 10 years. It's uh, I've done a lot. Okay. So Chad is coaching. You guys are on the mat next door. It's at Eisenhower. Does Delta go to Eisenhower? Is that something? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Chad's coaching his guy out his elbow pops out and it's out. He sees you. He's looking around. He's panicking. The kids going into shock. Chad sees you in your seat coaching walks over to you. And he's like, doc, you got to come help me. You come over, you put the kid's elbow back in and he's like, he said he went to look up and thank you because he was trying to, you know, cover the kid's arm up, keep the kid comforted. He said you were gone back coaching the match. <laughs> <laughs> that, sound right? yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, My brother loved right. it. He's like, yeah, he, he, he's gone. He was gone just like that. Right. So you're always down to help someone. Right. You're like a superhero. Um, Jared, what was the year for the uh, when they had to use Is it what's it called? AED co uh, Doc Manton. What's it called? Yeah, AED, automatic external AED defibrillator. The, yeah, the defibrillator, right? Jared, what year was that? 2018 or 2019? Was it 2019, Doc? 
I think so. 2019. 18 or 19. Yeah. Yeah. Walk us through that situation. What happened at Perrysburg High School in 2019? Yeah, we were at Perrysburg High School. I, they have two gyms, and I was in the auxiliary gym. And um, uh, uh, Gus Sacco, or Guy Sacco, uh, Seiko came over, Seiko. and he's like, yeah, Seiko, and he's like, hey, um, you know, he's a calm guy. He's like, hey, we need you over there. Some Somebody's not doing good. And I said, absolutely, you know. So I walked over there. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a, a grandpa that was watching his, his uh, grandson wrestle or uh, was getting ready to watch his grandson wrestle uh, dropped over and had a cardiac arrest. And so uh, we checked pulses. He didn't have any pulses. He wasn't breathing. And uh, fortunately, uh, there was a lot of people that came and helped and we were able to, uh, they were able to go get the AED. We put it on him, we shocked him and he was hugging his wife and kissing his wife on his way to the hospital um, and the ambulance. So it was an amazing uh, tribute to a lot of people that stepped up and they specifically the AED uh, being there and people knowing where it was and getting it. So it was a, it was a, it was, you know, they don't always have that happy. So that was a great thing. And then I was able to meet the whole family a couple of weeks later. Do you get that a lot when you save someone's life? Do you get a lot of gratitude from people? Um, I mean, you know, people, there's so many emotions going on, right? Like in the hospital when that happens. And so people don't often, I mean, I, I would say people are grateful, but they, they're so overwhelmed with emotion that stuff doesn't really come out. And that's fine. You know, I don't, you know, do it for the pat on the back. You do it because you want to do the right thing for folks. Uh, so I would say most people just kind of think it's our, our job and, 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 and they may not recognize the situation, how serious it is, you know, when it's obviously they're not breathing, we're shocking and things like that. And we get them back. But a lot of times the, the, the first responders get them back before they get to me. And then I just get to clean up what, you know, what they've already started. Wow. Yeah, that, that was, so that was great. pretty wild. I mean, Cody Bellamy was there. He, he you know, had experience with that. What guy ran and got the AD and you, and I think Al Bagdonis and, uh, mm -hmm. There's a few other guys, um, Lentz, uh, Eddie Lentz from St. Ed's as well. It was just wild. And then you guys kind of got to meet him then at the state tournament. And mm -hmm. it was just cool just seeing you guys talk to him. And it was it was pretty pretty cool experience just hearing him. He he made a joke because he was a, a basketball guy. I guess his, his wrestling buddies gave him, gave him hell because it was his first wrestling event he was at. Saying he couldn't handle wrestling <laughs> or something. <laughs> was yeah, was he, he a Liberty Center basketball guy? coach? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what high school, wasn't he? I'm not sure what high school he was at. I, I, I to be honest, I can't remember. But it, I mean, just even the location of the gym, right? It, I mean, if he was up in the stands, that like, you guys probably wouldn't have got to him. You know, who knows, right? I mean, no, yeah, it was. Like, yeah. It, there was a lot of things that went right, and and it was one of the good stories, right? That you know, we'll remember there, and and he'll remember definitely. Uh, so that was uh, that was pretty awesome. I mean, saving lives is just like a run of the mill thing. It's a day to day activity for you, man. It, it's wild. I mean, for me, like I remember the I showed up for a motor. There was a motorcycle uh, accident outside the the barn in Milan, and uh, I came out, and the Marzac guy from Toledo was there, and he had a face mask with him with the 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 thing you could squeeze, so mm -hmm. you didn't, he didn't have to give breaths. And I was doing chest compressions and the guy's sternum broke. Oh that my happens. goodness. Doc, I could I couldn't get your job. I couldn't do it. The yeah, things you see and the things you deal with. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you could do it if you're trained to do it and such. I couldn't do what you do. So, you know, it's just you know, it's kind of what, what I'm used to doing and, and it's, I'm fortunate enough to be, I love my job. I love where I'm at and, and, and such. So, and I'm, I'm very thankful that I get the opportunity to help uh, people when it's kind of their worst day. So Jared, we get to do something different on this podcast, right? We get, we get to have a doctor on, um, and, uh, you know, we're in the middle of, uh, we're in a pandemic, right? So, <laughs> Doc Benton, you and I talked about this right at the beginning of this, right? When they canceled the state tournament and you and I were talking about it and it was Zach's junior year, right? You remember that? I do remember that. Yes, that was a, yes, that was a rough. I, that was rough. You took the family up to the cabin up in Michigan, up north, and you guys stayed up there and kind of rode the early parts of it out, right? 
Correct. Yeah. We, the family stayed there till 4th of July, uh, for March. And then, uh, I had to come back and work. Uh, so, but I, I went back, I, I went up for about four or five weeks cause I had, or three or four weeks, I guess it was. Cause I had that I had taken off for NCAAs and, you know, state tournament and, and such. And, um, and then when they had already canceled, I stayed up there and then I came home and I didn't want to go back up cause I was worried of infecting them. So I stayed at home for probably, I think eight weeks by myself and Lee stayed up there with the boys till July. Oh my gosh. And that was when uh, I saw a picture of Zach Matt and he looked like a 157 pounder. Yeah, you know, he now was it looks swollen. Like, he was big. I know he looks like a 67 pounder now. So <laughs> he's a monster. But he's from, from the, that conversation that you and I had, how much more do we know about COVID-19? How much more would you say the medical health profession is, you know, there was no vaccine when you and I spoke the first time. Now we've got multiple vaccines. We're in a completely different place, right? How much more do you think you know compared to what we, you know, 22 months ago when we talked? Yeah, I, I think we've we've come a long way. Um, you know, when we first were seeing patients, you know, basically we didn't have much to offer them at all. And in in the survival rate once you got on a ventilator was was abysmal. And the when you got admitted, the uh, admission rate or death rate was uh, survival rate was terrible as well. And so when you look at the survival rate now compared to then, and how many people are getting on the ventilators compared to then, uh, we're we we we're we have twice or three times as many admissions for COVID now that we did in that first wave, but most of them are surviving. And then you add to that the treatments that we know that work, uh, the vaccine uh, helps us. If it doesn't help, uh, help you, you may still get it, but you're not getting sick enough to be admitted. I can, I can, I tell people when they ask me about the vaccine, I say, well, let me just put it to you in this way. I see, I probably seen, I don't know how many people let's just, let's, let's say it's a hundred. It's probably 500, but let's say I'd have a hundred admissions for COVID. I've admitted two people that were, that were vaccinated uh, 98% of the people that get admitted, meaning sick enough to get in the hospital, not sick, they have it. I've had it twice, um, but sick enough to be admitted um, were the folks that were unvaccinated. Uh, so I, I think the vaccinations help. Um, I think we have the monoclonal antibodies, uh, which have proven to be very successful uh, when you for folks that are a little more high risk. Um, the Omicron variant has been a little more challenging with the, uh, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. We had to switch over to a different one uh, because uh, in the supply of that is very low. So not as many people are getting that, but we've, you know, they have remdesivir, which was typically only an inpatient medicine. And now they're giving that as outpatient that we just rolled that out last week. Uh, so we're in a completely different place than we were. It's still uh, obviously uh, topic one on uh, everyone's radar and it's still impacting uh, people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but but we, we definitely feel like we can make a difference in the, in the healthcare community now. So it's been all consuming for, for 22 months, right? Like it has just consumed people's lives. It's even consuming your life more than the average bears, right? Like you, you are getting it from all directions. You're having people ask you questions all the time. You know, you live in Northwest Ohio in a rural area. So you've probably got people randomly asking you questions there. Obviously you're a doctor, you're in an ER room. You see all these different people as you have all these different cases. It, obviously are you sick of it are you are you are you do you have covid fatigue are you done talking about it where are you at with it you personally me personally i've i've been over covid for a long time and you know it's it's it is all consuming and it's very it's very taxing and it wears on us and it's like our 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 um work environment is no different than any others in the sense that it's stressful, right? And, and you add, a, a, we're short staffed, everyone's, so many people are out, uh, nursing is out, can't find nurses, uh, you know, and our docs are getting the Omicron or the uh, COVID and so we're short staffed and so we're having to work more. And so I'm definitely ready for it to be over. The number of meetings that as I'm the medical director to the hospital for the ER, so I have, and my responsibility is, you know, I have meetings and the amount of meetings that I've went to on COVID is, it's mind boggling to me. Um, you know, it's, it's literally, 
every day, uh, there's almost at least one meeting on, on COVID and how we're managing it or the testing or what tests we can do, what tests we can't do, what treatment we're doing, how we're going to roll this out for our ED and, and across the system. So uh, we're way over it. And, and I do, I worry about our workforce. I worry about our youth. I worry about everybody because it's taken a toll, a significant toll on the health, on the workforce and the healthcare. And it's taken a significant toll on just kids, right? Like the impact it's had on them. And so trying to find that sweet spot, you know, I, I think extremes either way are pretty rough to, to you know, I'm never a big fan of extremes either way. So um, I just, I just, I do worry about the damage that's, that's going to be done long-term, not have anything to do with COVID, but the, 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 what the effects of COVID on our psyche and our, our relationships and just our overall well being, especially in the work environment. You brought up monoclonal antibodies, right? And you actually said that's a, a treatment that you guys use, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to put maybe a tin foil hat on here a little bit and go maybe a little Joe Rogan, but I want to ask you about, um, obviously the, the, the big one, uh, Ivermectin was what he said he used, Joe Rogan, right? Ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, um, and all these other therapeutics as they're calling them. What is your take on those? And is there too much misinformation out there that makes your job harder? What do you think of those? And is that still, where, where's the medical profession as far as you guys, when they're talking about those as therapeutics and those as treatments? Sure. I, I think that, you know, the healthcare profession is no different than any other profession. There's lots of opinions out there. And so the, you know, the way I look at things is, uh, you know, I try to just kind of you know, absorb as much knowledge as I can from the folks that I trust and my infectious disease folks and folks that maybe are a lot smarter than me. And I can tell you that, uh, I've never written for ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, or uh, of that. I've not known any of the, our infectious disease doctors do that. I know there are some data that ivermectin can be uh, beneficial. I've personally, we don't give it in our in our ER. We don't give it in our hospital, and uh, and I think that and I think that's for good reason. I don't think there's enough data to show it's helpful yet. And, and, you know, if people want to do it, I mean, I personally wouldn't recommend it, but I think that there's, there is a subset of the healthcare that uh, believe in that. And, you know, I think that I know enough to say, I don't know at all. And so if it comes to find out that someday that's, that's a treatment that works, I think, you know, I think we, as providers, we just want to do what's going to make patients better. So, and I think most docs think that way. So if ivermectin worked, I think we would be using it. And if hydrochloroquine worked, I think we would be using it. And, and, and send it, at least in my facility, I trust the folks that, um, that, that we have these meetings because there's no gain. We just want people to survive and be healthy. So that, that, that's kind of my approach on it. You know, there's no incentive for me to withhold any treatment that I think is going to be beneficial. And so when people ask me about that, I give them the options of what we've shown to be helpful. And I've seen people get better on the monoclonal antibodies. And uh, now that we're rolling out remdesivir as outpatient, um, you know, I haven't, we haven't done it enough to see if that's going to be, how that's going to help people, but uh, it, it looks very encouraging. Does the politicalization of it right? Like this is one, it's been become this like left and right battle, right? Is that wearing on you at all? Or don't you listen to that? I don't, I, I try not to listen to it, but it's impossible to not be absorbed into it. Um, it drives me crazy. And like I told you, I think left wing, right wing, I think anytime you're too far in the extreme, you know, you, you know, I, I don't agree with one side or the other. You know, me personally, I think everyone should be vaccinated. I think I've seen the effects it has on families. I've seen the effects it has on people. Um, all my kids are vaccinated. And I would, I tell anybody that asks me, I think they should be vaccinated because it's the right thing to do. And I think you're, it's proven to show you're not going to get sick enough to go to the hospital. And, uh, and I just couldn't live with myself if I didn't get my kids vaccinated and they got sick and had to go to the hospital and something terrible happened when there's something that could have probably kept them out of the hospital. Now, the vast majority of kids will do just fine and, and won't need that. So I understand and respect and, and uh, I'm never one of these folks that think you're evil if you don't get the vaccine. I just think it's, you know, I, I, it's not the decision I would have made and I would recommend, but that's we're human and we're allowed to have, make our, our own decisions. Right. 
So you're a live and let live guy, and this is what you're saying. Like, you're not losing your mind or mad at people who don't want to wear face masks or anything like that. You're kind of like, hey, well, that's your choice. Live with your consequences, right? Right. But I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. If I'm seeing a patient in the room and they're not going to wear a mask, I ask them to wear a mask. And I've never had anybody not wear a mask. So people have been very respectful, you know, um, as far as those requests, um, even if they didn't believe in it and such, at least in the hospital. Uh, but I, out in the public, I, you know, I, if people want to wear masks, they wear masks. If they don't wear masks, they don't wear masks. But when I'm working and I'm seeing somebody with a cough and stuff, I'd rather they wear a mask. Right. And, and so people do that, but no, I don't, I don't get involved with that. I, I think I'm more of a, you know, let people make a decision that they think is best for them. And I just hope they make the decision uh, from an educated perspective and they don't let uh, political views either way, steer them in, in the wrong direction. I guess the, the other question, you know, that I have for you is you, I saw you wearing a mask at the uh, pit. Your mask looked like a respirator. You look like Bane from freaking uh, Batman. What was the mask you were wearing? Yeah, that, well, so I wear, you know, imagine going through an eight hour shift wearing those N95 masks, right? They're super hot. They're uncomfortable. They're miserable to wear. That mask there it, well, that I'm wearing, it's an N95 and it was, um, it was, com it's very comfortable. You can breathe easy in it and it's, it doesn't, ruin your face, dimple your face, and it's not as hot. So I just wore it for the comfort level as uh, I had uh, I had had COVID like two weeks before that. So I just wanted to be extra safe uh, with people. I was fine. I was definitely outside the window, but I didn't want, I just never want to be that person, you know, that's at all, you know, possible spreading it and stuff. Some of the information that people are getting, they're coming and they're, they're dumping the information on your lap, right? They get it from a podcast like Joe Rogan. They're getting it from YouTubers. They're getting it from not doctors, right? So you're getting well, yeah. all the well, information. Right? Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information out there. And what we have known, what we recognize, at least I recognize, is people don't know everything. So I think that if you, if you, if you believe that doctors want you to be better, if they, if they want to give you the treatment that's going to work, then I, I look at it as why wouldn't we do medicine that we think that has been proven to work. And so I think that from my, that's where I go back to, you know, the, I assume the reason we're not getting ivermectin is because it hasn't been proven enough in randomized stru studies for it, for us to do it. Cause there's no reason not to do that. Um, if it works. So, uh, and again, I'm not trying to get political on it. It just, for me, I know that the providers that I work with, they want people to stay healthy and they want people to improve and they don't want people to get sick and die. So we're doing everything we can to, to make sure that happens and, and make sure that death doesn't happen in, in, in bad mortality and morbidity. Um, so we're coming at it from a good place. So I, I feel totally comfortable doing the treatments we do, such as steroids, monoclonal antibodies, that remdesivir, those kind of things. So um, that's kind of my thoughts. Okay, so the second largest podcast on the planet, Joe Rogan Experience, only second to the Barbarian Hour. You got this go. guy, right? He, he's the second largest podcast. We're the biggest. Anyhow, Joe Rogan is, um, you know, he's, he's putting out a lot of information out there. He did the ivermectin thing. That was him, right? Mm -hmm. He did the ivermectin thing. Um, so he's, he's, he's out here. He's talking about all these therapeutics. He's talking about. Oh man, you gotta get in the sauna. And you do, do, do jujitsu two hours a day, and you like whatever. I mean, that's I'm, I'm joking, but you know, living a healthy lifestyle, doing cardio every day, you know, three days a week, whatever, half hour, uh, drinking a lot of water, you know, getting sleep, not drinking, doing drugs, right? Yeah, clean living, right? So he comes out there and he's saying all these things. Is he saying anything? Or if they put a petition in front of you to silence Joe Rogan? Would you sign it or should Joe Rogan have a voice? I mean, I think we all should. I think, yeah, I think they should have a voice. I mean, I mean, I don't have to agree with everything he says, um, but I think that he says a lot of good things too, right? Like live a clean life, go get exercise, lose some weight, you know, take some vitamins. I mean, those type of things are no brainer, right? The better, what we do know is the worse shape you are in when you get COVID, the worse you're going to do. And so if you're healthy, fit, 
um, good BMI and you are, you know, doing those things, the odds are you're going to do pretty well. So I'm never for censoring folks if they're, if they're coming from a good place. Um, and I don't, I think he believes what he's saying. And, and so I, I have no problem. I think it's our job to be educated, to, um, decide what's best for us and our family in those situations. And that's, that, listen, that's refreshing for you to tell me that I appreciate that. Because whether I like him or not, he could be going out and saying some complete nonsense. And my thing is like, this is America. We have a first yeah. amendment and I believe in it as long as he's not threatening people's lives. Right. Or hurting kids. Those are the kind of my two things I can't really stand for. He's not out there. Like you would think that this guy is just murdering people. Right. Let's like the way that uh, here's some, uh, news sources talk about him and I'm like, no, that it's insane what you're saying. It's insane to censor someone who is saying some stuff's right. Right. I mean, that to me is insane. I don't know. Sounds like no. you agree with me, but I don't want to put word in, words in your mouth. No, I agree. I think that, you know, I, I don't think you should ever be vilified for not going along with the mainstream. And and I say that from a folk, you know, person that, again, I don't really agree with the ivermectin. I don't really agree with the hydrochloroquine. So, um, but I, I don't think just because someone else's beliefs is different than yours, you should be vilified by any one group or another. So, Jared, so coming up in an hour, right? We're getting there, but we, we listen. This man runs a massive tournament that we need to talk about. Right. Mike, how big is the novice state? How big is that tournament? Well, it's turned into quite the tournament. You know, I think uh, the last, we, we didn't have it last year because of COVID, uh, but the year before we had it and we had, uh, was it uh, 870 kids uh, at the that event? That is massive. And it that is the capacity, right? Like three weeks before or something. I mean, it, it yeah. had a lot more, right? It wasn't like, oh yeah, we could have had that. We could have probably had another 300. We shut it down two and a half weeks early. You could and have gone you, over a thousand. Oh, easily. Like oh uh, Jared, God. Jared. The knows facility it. hold it. What's that? Well, hold no, the that's facility? the thing. Well, the, we, the facility would hold it. There's not enough seats. And that's the, that's the rate limiting step is uh, the seats. Um, it was situation was probably it, if we probably could have pushed it a little bit more cause we were pretty efficient and stuff, but uh, it was a pretty bizarre. Um, I, I wish it not, didn't get canceled because of COVID because I think the numbers we, we could, we would have probably uh, figured out a way to go over adding four or four more, five more mats and, and just bring in chairs or do, do two sessions or, uh, but the, the, the demand is, is there. So it is literally it's called novice novice state championships, correct? Yes. And when and where is it? It's uh, uh, February 5th at Seagate Hall in uh, Seagate Center in Toledo, Ohio. So we have uh, okay. 14 mat 14 mats and uh, uh, Rudis uh, sponsored all the awards. So each uh, champ is going to get a uh, Rudis shoes and uh, both finalists gets a uh, Rudis uh, uh, long sleeve shirts. Now we can, we're okay with the rudest shoes. Okay. We, we'll, we'll give you the rudest shoes. All right. Oh, we know sorry. Rudis does a good shoe. Oh man. We have to edit I don't out. care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to us. We're glad that, that, that those folks are supporting wrestling. I know Barbarian Apparel's glad that those guys are supporting wrestling. So here, when we look at it though, you get over 800 kids. You're at the Seagate center. It's the same uh, facility for the national middle school duels. Is this something where do you guys have, is Dom involved in this? Is Jared involved in this? Who do you, you know, in Northwest Ohio kind of go to, to help you out with this? Is this just Delta? Who is, who are you working with? Sure. Um, I, Dom is not involved. He does his own thing. Jared, you know, the OEC, we've had it when great, uh, I wouldn't say partners were allies, right? And, and he's been so very, OEC has been super supportive of the novice state. And it goes along with their mission of providing opportunities for kids. And we think it's that like the junior league to the OAC state tournament and your kids are getting old enough to uh, Zeb to get in that OAC tournament pretty soon. Right. Uh, how old is My your kids oldest? would go to your tournament. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, my tournament is the kind of the junior leagues. And once you win, if you place or what we found is there's a strong correlation. Once you, if you can win or place at novice state that next year, you're probably going to do really good at the OAC tournament um, because it's turned into quite uh, the opportunity for, for these kids to get on a, 
a stage that maybe they wouldn't ever have that opportunity because, you know, Jared and, and Jude, they put on the uh, OAC state tournament, which is, it's such a meat grinder and it is so hard for the, for the average kid to qualify for that. And, uh, you know, recognizing again, when we go back to thinking about this novice concept, you know, we wanted to, we recognize it's a marathon, right? It's a marathon and we wanted to get the kids started on that journey of getting the bug and that bug to, to have success. Cause it's hard to, when a kid goes out there and just gets waxed every match and say, Oh, keep coming back. You know? So, you know, we recognize it's not nearly as tough as the OAC state tournament, but you know what? It's cool because these kids are all in theory about the same skill level. And so they can go against peers that have similar skill sets and that everybody's pretty similar once you get towards the, you know, the end of it all. And, and uh, it's, it's been pretty cool to watch from, you know, where it developed in our mind to where it's at now. So. Mike, what would you say to me? You know, my kids are wrestling, they're doing it. We were at practice tonight. Um, just talking to some parents tonight. And um, my biggest thing for me is I just, every night is guys have fun, have fun do your best. That is literally my two pieces of advice every night. I love you. Right. I love you guys. Go out, do your best. Listen to coach, make sure you have fun. How do we, how do I, what did you do for your boys? How did you build a love for it? How did you make them want to do it? Cause you can't listen, if there's something you don't want to make them do, it's wrestling and whatever you did with, with Cole, I don't know, man, you, you, you should have went and bought a lottery ticket while you're at it. Cause that, that is amazing what you did because as uh, Andrew Wolf told me, Andrew Wolf's a coach at Aurora. He was a coach at Kent State for my nephew, Ian, Indiana guy. He said, I said, hey, how do you make your kids love this? He said, you can't make them love it. He goes, but you can absolutely make them hate it. How do you make them oh, love it? What, what is your, like, I, listen, I, the most powerful thing someone's ever said to me and made me think, and I keep repeating him, Andrew Wolf said that to me, and, and, and how right is he, and, and how do you foster a love for wrestling? Well, that's a deep question there. And I don't know if there's any one answer. I can just tell you that for me, I, I mean, made, I've, I know I've made mistakes over the years with the boys, right? I, I felt, you know, I, I'm much better now at perspective, right? But at the moment, they, you know, they lose matches and you get mad, right? And you make that mistake as a dad and you're like, you come back with your tail between your legs saying, I'm sorry, son, for getting on you, you know? And, but, you know, I, I think I said it at the beginning of it, you know, a couple of philosophies here. I'm kind of, uh, kind of getting a little wandering here. Kids at young age, they're extrinsically motivated, right? Like your son likes wrestling because you like wrestling and you take him to it and you make it fun. And, you know, dad, I want to do good. Right. But he doesn't really understand. Like he doesn't know what it takes to be really good yet. Right. He has no idea. He knows he likes going to practice. He likes spending time with you. He likes uh, rolling around with his friends and he comes at the end of the day, he may get some ice cream or he'll get an attaboy and, you know, he'll get uh, a t-shirt at the, uh, you know, Lakota invite or, you know, Kenston invite um, if he goes there. And um, so for me, it was, I built a foundation. I tried to build a foundation where practice was like, they would do, they always did the Delta practices, right? Like Del just Delta community-based practice two days a week. And then we would try to do one day a week where I went somewhere where they would get what yeah, I would describe as different kids or quote tougher kids, and maybe like Milan or Perrysburg or Foxfire or something like that. And that where I could be kind of going to dad mode and I could watch them. Cause when I was coaching in the room, I never coached them. I didn't talk to them. I didn't look at them. I just, because uh, you know, I wanted to be there for the other kids because um, I think it's real important to have your kids be successful, they need good teammates because it's so much easier to win when you got a great team. Because you know, winning is contagious and losing is contagious. So my, my first goal is to get their friends to want to wrestle and be good. So we did two days a week at, at the Delta practices and one day a week at Milan. And then I'm, you know, in my living room, I have this wrestling barn, but in my living room, I would <laughs> do do that. And then we would just do local tournaments um, initially. And then when I thought they were good enough to go outside of that. Then we went outside of that. And um, I, I limited how many matches they would have. And uh, I cut it off. Uh, the end of a year, we did OAC and uh, the tournament. And then I did one dual meet tournament, which was fun in like uh, early April. And then the they were done wrestling um, 
till uh, November, October. October, we'd start, and then the first tournament they would do would be like Tulsa once they were getting of age of that. So for me, I think limiting competition, I think competition wears on kids um, because of the pressure, especially if they're competing in events that they probably shouldn't be at. And so for me, it will, and, and I think that, again, my wife and I, if you're going to do something and if you want to be good at it, we're going to talk about what that means and we're going to execute that plan. So when they're five or six, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means they do push-ups, right? Like we do push-ups three days a week and we, I'd build a little calendar. And once they filled up the calendar, they would go get a Nintendo game or, you know, something like that. And, and then it would, and then as they got older, we'd add pull-ups to that mix. And then when they got older, we would do, um, you know, just different type of things um, to help motivate them because again they don't know how to go out and go for a three mile run at age nine right like no place one kid out of a million is wired to be motivated at that age and so um you i asked them what their goals were we talked about how to get to those goals and then my job was to hold them to the things that they had to do and not in a bad way there'd always be a reward um and some were easier to do like drew and zach they were like just type it in and they would do it. Cole, I was, uh, you know, Cole's the kid that needed, and I made the mistakes early on. He's the kid that needed constant praise um, and, 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 and um, always had to be praised, nothing negative at all. And I didn't learn that till he was older. And, and once I did that, I, he flourished, I flourished and, and life was good. And Adam's probably more wired like Cole and Drew and Zach are probably more wired like each other that they're just, you know, they're just like all in, you know, um, from, they were all in from age six and, uh, you know, Cole quite wasn't quite sure, sure. So I don't know the answer, but that's kind of my thoughts on, on some of those issues. I love it. I love it. Cause I'm always listening to people. I like just listening and feeling, you know, kind of feeling what people are saying to me, thinking about it, how it's applicable to my kids. And I got two totally different kids and I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, I just try and figure it out. And I have, I don't have the answers. Don't have the answers. I'm just trying to figure it out. That's my thing. Just trying to figure it out. I'm just that, listening man. to the kids. You guys are dealing with boys and you guys are familiar with boys. I'm trying to figure the, the kid thing out and the girl thing out. Man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah you. Woo. Jared. Woo. Woo. I do think you're I do think your friend that mentioned that you can't make a kid love it, but you can make a kid hate it is a wonderful quote. And I think um, you know, every parent of of young wrestlers should hear that and, so true. and and think about that. And I think I'm going to steal that, Zeb. So thank That's, you. Yeah, Andrew Wolf. He I talked to him yesterday. He's a coach at Aurora. He was a Kent State coach, he wrestled for Coach Goldman at Indiana. And he's a Maple Heights coach. He's Jamie Milkovich's assistant coach at Maple Heights. Hmm. And he's just like the super intelligent guy. And he understands wrestling. And, he, you know, he, he, coached, he coached Ian. He coached Dustin Kilgore. He's, he clearly knows wrestling, right? And I think he's the type of guy that I don't think he wanted to be at that level anymore. And he wanted to get a physical education, PE job, physical education. And he's been at Maple Heights, but he's just a smart guy. And he's, Ferd actually wrestled his son. And then... I don't know. It was like they had this crazy shootout and he third won 13 to 12. Right. And now third is kind of like, I don't want to compete anymore. And I'm like, dude, don't compete anymore. I'm good. I'm good. Cause cause doing it for me, doing this sport for somebody else, it's the last sport to do for somebody else. Oh, you can't do it. You, know, and that's, <laughs> you can't you are, do it. You are, that is poison. Off. That is poison right there. If there's one thing the good doctor is going to tell us, don't do it for somebody else, right? We, you can't. I mean, you can do it for a little while, but boy, like, you know, I look at what the boys are going through in college and you, there is no chance they could do that sport unless they love it, right? And Jared, you know that. And Zeb, you know it. You just can't do division one, let alone big 10 wrestling. And if you don't absolutely love it, misery and just, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just, you it's, nailed it. You nailed it. Cause I can just tell you, man, it is just like my nephew Wyatt is now at app state with, with, uh, Ian. Right. And you know, it's a D one program. They're, in the yeah. SoCon. They're not in the big time, right. They're not in the Mac. They're not in the PAC 12. The SoCon's different. You get it. I want you to think about when Drew Matten was making 125 in the Big oh Ten every weekend twice. Oh my God, I can't think That'll of a be wired just a, at least a little bit different. You can't be wired normally. 
right? Oh, yeah. just a little bit, at least a little bit wired differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. He is going to be a killer as a doctor. And I don't mean like a Jack Kevorkian killer. I mean, he is going to be an excellent doctor, right? What, uh, what is the process, Mike, for him when he goes to med school and then he's got a residency? What is the actual process that you had to go through? He's going to have to go through. Yeah, so it's four years of med school. And then uh, once he's done with that, he'll pick a specialty. And uh, depending on that specialty, it'll be three to six years after that um, of tr- a specialty training. So you then, did four years four, undergrad, four, four years undergrad, med school, three, three to years. six years residency. I did, th- I did a three-year residency. Emergency medicine is three-year residency. What's orthopedic so, and what's ear, nose and throat? And what's yeah, those are like, those are five, six years, five years. And then if you do a spe- fellowship in like, you know, sports, <laughs> sports medicine or shoulder or knee or ankle, it's another year. So like you're getting six or so. My wife's cousin is Dr. Shock, the surgeon. He's a surgeon up in Green Bay. And uh, he, he was a national champion for Michigan and hockey in like 96 hmm. or 97. So we've gone to, he's got a house up north on uh, Mullet Lake. Oh, wow. yeah. Is it Mullet area. or Burt? I forget if it's Mullet or Burt. What are the two that are, Mullet and Burt are connected, aren't Mullet they? Connect, yeah, Mullet and Burt are connected. He's Burt, and then his dad's got a house on Mullet. I think that's what Beautiful. it is. Beautiful area. I'm like, I, I got a place like five minutes, 10 minutes yeah. from, that, from there. Yeah, so he's a doctor in Green Bay. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I, what you guys do as doctors and, and then become, you know, medical doctors, what you guys do is incredible. I hope you don't trip on your cape a lot and fall down because it is like a Superman type job. I'm not even joking. I'm not uh, even kidding. What you do is I just, I can't even imagine. I know you're like, oh, so I couldn't be a teacher, but you'd absolutely be totally fine being a teacher. I wouldn't I be know. fine being a doctor. Let's just, let's just put that out there. Jared, do you got anything else for Mike? No, Mike, I just want to say thanks for all the insight tonight. I just, I enjoyed, I've said I didn't talk much tonight, but I enjoy listening. So thanks for sharing your insight and, obviously all you do for the sport and um, you know, looking forward to seeing you guys kill it at uh how Nava state you guys obviously do an awesome job. So keep up the great work. You and your Mike, are there still openings? Team. Oh yeah. Yep. There, there, there's openings. So um, yes, you can, uh, I, I don't, how do you get there? Navastate.com I think is, yep, is the one. That's you, it. You, yep. Navastate.com. You can register and uh, there, there is still openings uh, as of now. So but yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on. You know, you guys are so influential in, in Ohio wrestling and Zeb across the country and, you know, getting our word out uh, about wrestling and Jared, the impact that you, the OAC has had on, on obviously just the wrestling community is, is you can't even put a, a, a price tag on it, what you've done uh, for elevating the game. And then you, not to mention all the other sports uh, that are out there. It, uh, so it, it really means a lot to me that you guys are having me on and, and I appreciate it very much no thanks for all you like, do. this will be the first year you're gonna miss right first boy first but oec year without a boy in the tournament right it is the first year so think about that so drew was the first year at the very first oec grade school which is in bg right right yeah he was he was uh i look at those brackets back then and and so like that i think that out of that first year's placers and he was 40 pounds or whatever the lightest weight was, eight and under, I think it was back then, their first year. Right. I think I think four or six of the state placers, or four or five of the state placers were uh, wrestled D1. That's crazy. And, and back in, what year was that? What was the first year of uh, I school? think it was 2004, maybe? Yeah, 2004, because he was six. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. And it was, it was eight and under then. Eight, right? yeah, eight no and six, under. Yeah. yeah. I know he, I had an event I had to go to. Uh, I, so I, I got him to, he was made it to the semis and I told my dad, I said, Hey, listen, you know, I, I got him to the semis, your job to get it done. And I knew he had a really tough draw and he wasn't going to win. And he got, he got waxed. He went through, Oh, he did the old triple dip for six. And I, I gave my dad grief for about a month after that. So, but um, yeah. I, I, I your dad helped that. coach it. I remember seeing him. I, I was, yeah. He I was, was yeah. there coaching with you at all. Of them, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mario Guillen won that bracket, if I remember right. And he's at OU right now wrestling. So a lot of good kids wow. over the years. Wow, that's crazy. I love hearing it. I remember, I think I interviewed you at your last one. Maybe it was last year or the year before. Yeah, it was like this past year. Yep. Yeah, and, I interviewed uh, you and it's like, this is it, man. It's been a, it was 18 years. 2004 to 2021. So, oh my yeah. God, 17 years. 17 years. Adam wasn't even born yet. No. 
<laughs> no, that <laughs> confirms oh I'm, old. I'm old. Oh, that's crazy. Mike, thank you for the time. Hey, if you get a chance, go over to barbarianapparel.com. Check out what's going on with Josh Sasfi and the Barbarian Apparel. Mike, Matt, and the guests tonight. Mike, I appreciate you. Jared, thank you for, for everything tonight too as well. Thanks, guys.